Ben Pierce on the browser tracker. Recently, the high-rise camera, which is a really, really high-resolution camera that's orbiting Mars, released six pictures that show the interesting caption of SpaceX Starship Landing Site. Now, we don't know a whole lot about these. Both NASA and SpaceX have been fairly quiet about this. But what we do know is these sites were selected and entered in by a person working for JPL for NASA, the same person who actually requested the pictures for the Mars 2020 landing site. So this is a person who's intimately familiar with landing sites on Mars, and he is helping SpaceX to getting their potential landing site for Starship on Mars. So we know now that NASA is in fact working with SpaceX. But what do we actually know about Mars landing sites? What do these pictures actually teach us? Let's start tracking these things down. First of all, let's look at the history of landing things on Mars. Now I'm going to ignore the ones that failed for the most part, especially all of the early Soviet ones. We're going to start with the first successful landings on Mars, and those were from the Viking landers. Now, the Viking landers already had some kind of a concept as to what the atmosphere of Mars was like, that it was relatively thin, and they had a general approach, but they didn't have any really good imagery. So basically, what they did is they used the first orbiting mission around Mars, which was Mariner 9, to gather relatively high resolution data so they could at least get a, a decent grasp on the site. And they actually used radar imagery from Earth. See, when you point a radar at Mars, you can actually get some kind of a sense as to how rough it is. If you have a really, really clean signal, then the land must be very, very smooth. If you have a kind of rocky return that's broadened out some, then it must be rocky because there's longer period of time that it takes to reflect back. So they use these radar images. They also use the images from Viking itself, which were a little bit higher resolution than the Mariner 9. Because the Viking landers were part of the orbiter, they could take their time a little bit to really figure out the landing site. They didn't have to commit like most modern landers do to a particular spot when they first entered Mars. They could take their time. They were originally going to try to land Viking 1 on July 4th. It ended up being July 20th, I believe, when they finally, finally made the decision on where to land and went ahead and did it. They were, of course, successful. Viking 2 followed a similar trajectory. Beyond there, we don't have a lot of landers on Mars for quite a while. The next real attempt was the Pathfinder mission. And Pathfinder had the Mars Global Surveyor that was sent just a little bit before it, which could update things. It also had some thermal measurements, but it basically used the same thing as the Viking missions. It uh, could take advantage of the fact that we had a complete global map of the Viking data, so that way it really had a reasonably high-resolution map of everything. It could also use the thermal data. Now, thermal data is really interesting for landing site selection, if something will change its temperature really, really quickly, you know that it's like a sand. If it takes a lot longer, and it must be something that has a lot more thermal inertia, which would be like a boulder, you can get a sense as to what the material is of an area, although you can't really see it. It still continued to be somewhat of an issue, this landing site selection. The next mission from the United States to pick a landing site on Mars was the Mars Polar Lander, which used the same kinds of data sets, just a little bit more data from Mars Global Surveyor. Of course, this mission failed for reasons that are completely unrelated to its landing site selection, but it's still of some note. You can take a look at some of the landing site photos, and you see something you don't see in modern ones, which are huge boulders. If the Viking landers had landed just a little bit differently, they could have landed where one of the foot was on a boulder, and the mission would have never succeeded. It would have tilted over and game over. So we're really kind of lucky that we found a reasonable landing site. But in more modern missions, they try to avoid that. The last one that went with this kind of old method was uh, Spirit on Opportunity, the Mars Exploration Rovers. And they had the advantage of a lot better thermal data, so they were able to get a much better sense of what was actually there, but you still couldn't actually see the types of hazards that were really potentially dangerous. Enter the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. 
The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was proposed by a scientist at the University of Arizona named Alfred McEwen, who wanted to be able to really see the sites around Mars, to be able to identify any landing sites. And so the proposal was to send a telescope that had a resolution of about 25 centimeters. So you could resolve an object that's about a meter, basically a couple of feet across, you could resolve. And in so doing, we could identify landing hazards very, very easily, far easier than using this very imprecise method of radar or thermal imaging. And so we did. We sent this telescope there. It was launched in 2005. It managed to orbit Mars safely with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter in 2006. I actually worked as a student on this program and got a really good grasp. It was the first real space mission that I did any work with. In 2007, we launched the Phoenix Lander towards Mars. The Phoenix Lander had the mission to try and once and for all conclusively prove that there was ice underneath the surface of Mars. So it didn't really care much about the geology of the landscape. It wanted to land in a certain region that was believed to have ice based off of orbital data we had, and it wanted to make sure that there was nothing remotely hazardous there. And so they took images of different sites. And first they used the context camera, which is another camera on MRO that is higher resolution than anything that had been set before, but we have the high-rise camera that far and exceeds it. In the Phoenix landing site selection, there were four regions that were identified on Mars. And we imaged them with the context camera, which wasn't a really high-resolution camera, but it could get a better grasp of the things. It's a higher resolution camera than anything had been sent to Mars before, other than high-rise, but it arrived on the same mission as high-rise, so it doesn't get a whole lot of fanfare, although it currently actually has the highest resolution map of Mars that is in existence. Anyways, they imaged these four potential sites, and they also took a few pictures of high-rise images throughout all of the sites just to kind of get an idea of what the landscape was like. Well, the primary area that was proposed for landing, it actually turned out that there was a lot of really nasty stuff there. And so they focused in on a couple of different regions. So they they had these regions that were proposed. They selected um, three candidate landing ellipses and high-rise imaged each and every speck of dirt in that image that it could manage to get from orbit. And by so doing, they were able to determine a safe landing site and it landed safely, and you can see that there's not a whole lot of rocks in the images here. The next NASA lander that was sent there was the Curiosity rover, which had a little bit better conditions. It could land in a smaller landing ellipse, but it still had to be able to safely land there. And so high-rise was again used in a very similar fashion to help determine the safe and engineering landing site. High-rise has been used for the ESA landers that have tried to land during this period of time, And they also were used for the Red Dragon mission, which has never landed, but it was another private mission that was proposed by SpaceX. And in fact, it uh, had some really good data. Some of these images are actually really close to the proposed landing sites for Starship from previous SpaceX images, close enough that it might be that SpaceX is predetermined on this region and they may use some of the Red Dragon data that had been previously collected. There's no reason not to. It's just as good a quality as the current data. Let's talk about a landing site on Mars. There's basically two contradictory things that determine a good landing site on Mars. You have the science value where you want to have a site that has a lot of really good science so you can learn a lot of stuff. And you have the engineering value, which is you've got to have somewhere that you can land safely. So these two kind of tie off on each other. Mars has the largest volcanoes in the solar system. And it'd be kind of interesting to study these, but we can't actually land there, at least not with our current paradigm, because they're too high in the atmosphere. And when I was with the high-rise team, I attended one of the science meetings, and one of the scientists was talking about the joys of finding rocks. And the engineering team was all like, no, we don't want to hear anything about these rocks. But they have a lot of really good things that they can teach. So engineering and science teams tend to clash as to where can we land safely and where can we get the most science. Now, with the SpaceX missions, in particular with the Starship mission, the science is not necessarily the primary goal. Will there be science done? Almost certainly. 
But the primary goals of SpaceX in going to Mars is to be able to have water and be able to land safely and be able to provide enough power. So what can we say from the proposed images that have been taken so far? Well, first of all, there were six images that have been released. There are at least two others that have been taken and not yet released. And there is one that is proposed that has not been taken, at least as of when I last looked at this. So we know that there are these nine sites. Most of them are in one particular region of Mars, which has been previously not really studied by any kind of lander because it's kind of a boring region. But that's actually a, a good thing as far as SpaceX is concerned. It is believed to have water underneath the surface. Let's take a look at some of these images and we can get a better sense as to how these go. This is one of the high-rise images of the Starship candidate site. So we're going to look at it in a little bit more detail. But before we start looking to things, I want to point out a couple of things. This was taken by HiRise, which is a push broom camera. Now, I have an earlier video that talks a little bit about cameras, but basically you can think of it like a fax machine where it looks at one strip of land at the ground below on Mars and it will take an image and then keep moving and continue to do this kind of like a fax machine works. Except for instead of the paper moving, the machine moves. It has 14 sensors. 10 of them are a red color, which is just represented by the grayscale here. Two of them are infrared, and two of them are a blue-green sensor. And so they represent the color section that you see here in the middle, these particular values. The distance across here is about five kilometers, roughly. So each one of the images you see previously of high rise, they're about five kilometers, just to give you a scale. So let's go ahead and just look at the high level view of this particular side and then look at the more detailed view. This is done with the High View program, which is a program that they released. It is done using the JPEG 2000 interface, which it's kind of like a Google Maps type interface that you can zoom into a particular image. Highrise likes to use this because they have really, really, really large images. And it is being served over the internet over a protocol called the JPIP protocol. I had a little bit to do with that, so I'm kind of proud. Anyways, let's take a little, really quick look at the high-level view, and then we'll look at some of the details. So you can see, for the most part, this is a fairly bland region. They have some interesting texture here that we'll look at in more detail when we get in closer. Uh, it doesn't look like any particular hills. This is a little bit more rough terrain, maybe some kind of a delta feature. I'm not a scientist, so don't quote me on this. You can see this region here, this is the infrared sensor IR10-0, has a issue where it needs to warm up a little bit or it'll kind of underperform. So you can see that it took a little bit of time to get there, but it got there in the end with the image, uh, which it always does. That's a characteristic of high rise. And a lot of these imaging sensors will have that kind of stuff. So let's look in the center part of this image. So we're going to zoom to the actual size. You can see it's going to take a little bit of time to load up properly. But you can see this kind of texture, which kind of reminds me of a basketball, actually. Interesting. We'll focus mostly on the color region. You can see that it looks fairly bland. This is one of the more interesting, as in more hazardous regions, but even then it looks fairly bland. Now, what they did with this image is they shot two images side by side and they, uh, they're in a stereo format. So essentially the camera was pointed at a different angle and kind of like you have your two eyes that are you know, looking at the same thing from a different angle, you can get a, a sense of the depth with them. I'm only looking at one of those images, but they can, they have tools that will make a digital elevation map so you can see exactly what the elevation is of everything and see if your lander could actually make it safely. And they can do that with each of the images that they have taken. But at the first glance, this doesn't look particularly hazardous. This region is really safe looking.
course, you have to have the entire landing ellipse be safe. And so some of the stuff might be a little bit less so. Let's just go down towards the bottom region. This may be a little bit more hazardous. Uh, you can see there's some slopes that would cause some issues, especially I imagine if you tried to land right here at the ridge that it could potentially be dangerous or along here. But I understand that this might be a region that's more likely to have ice, so you could dig into these mountains perhaps and get some water ice. Uh, let's look at this. See how fast my internet is. These images are absolutely enormous here. So yeah, the same kind of thing. Let me give my review of the overall sites and you can take a look at more detail. I've included links to each one of the images so that you can go look at these for yourself. You could download this high view tool if you want to just to go ahead and explore Mars. And hey, if you're interested, you can keep looking at other regions too. There's a lot of really, really neat pictures out there that High Rise has done. It's probably my favorite camera. Of course, I'm prejudiced. I worked for it, but it has some really neat stuff out there. Go and take a look. So what do we really know? Well, we know that NASA is helping SpaceX to determine where they could land Starship safely. Presumably, this is for the 2022 mission, but we know the 2022 mission is supposed to help find the resources that are necessary to have humans be able to land there safely and be able to return a Starship back to Earth. But it's good that NASA is involved and that they're helping figure these things out because, quite frankly, they have more experience with this than anyone. Nobody has successfully landed something on Mars except for NASA. Nobody. And many people have tried. The Soviets sure tried a whole bunch. ESA's tried twice, and it hasn't happened yet. It'll eventually happen, I'm sure, that somebody else will land there. But it's taken its time. And it's good that NASA's willing to share this knowledge with SpaceX. And it, as I've said many times before, I think it could be a very mutually beneficial arrangement. Let me know if I'm missing anything or if you guys have any comments or questions. And until next time, keep on tracking. Take care.